Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So in the previous part of this lecture, we went through all the different shapes of volcanic systems and all the different eruption styles, or so we thought. I thought I'd leave this particular one to have its own standalone uh, entry because this type of eruption has a truly dramatic effect on the world around it and on the direction and the evolution of life. And that is a flood basalt eruption. So in this lecture, we're going to be exploring what a flood basalt eruption is, what it looks like, what it produces, and also exploring the mechanisms by which we think these kind of eruptions form, and then the consequences of these eruptions for both the shape of the Earth's surface and the evolution of life. However, what's interesting about these kind of eruptions is the style they represent kind of gets forgotten about a little bit when we talk about volcanoes. The headline grabbing uh, volcanic eruptions are things like Planean and Palaean eruptions that are massively explosive, produce huge ash columns and pyroclastic density currents that are incredibly devastating. Uh, you can't outrun the pyroclastic density current, so people tend to worry about them a lot more. Whereas effusive eruptions can kind of seem a bit eh compared to those. Like, yeah, lava flows are bad and they destroy everything in their path and all, but you know, you can walk away from it and like. Uh, outrun it pretty simply. So there's no sort of like direct existential threat. So it's kind of ironic that possibly the most devastating type of eruption and the most dramatic type of eruption is an effusive eruption. Um, that is what a flood basalt eruption is. It And this kind of eruption is thousands of times worse in terms of climactic effects and effects on life and even if changes the entire surface of the earth it's so it's even worse than a super volcano. It, it's even worse than a VEI eight on the explosivity index, and yet it would register as a VEI naught on the V on the volcanic explosivity index scale. Uh, it produces very little explosive volcanism. Uh, it's mostly effusive lava flows. So what is it? Uh, a flood basalt eruption is essentially a Hawaiian or Icelandic or a fissure type eruption, but on a truly different scale. So it's a large scale effusive eruption that happens over a relatively short time period in geological terms, talking about a few tens of thousands to a few million years, but it will produce substantial volumes of magma. So to be classified as a flood basalt eruption, it has to uh, it has to erupt over 1 million kilometers cubed of magma, so truly huge volumes. Uh, this produces thick lava flows that can cover huge areas over hundreds of kilometers squared. These volcanic eruptions, the magma they produce and the lavas they produce are incredibly hot, and so the magma is very runny. It has a very low viscosity and produces this flood-like effect. It just spreads out over very, very large distances relatively quickly. And most types of flood basalt eruption are mafic in composition, producing basaltic rocks, hence how they get their name. They're flood basalt. They are floods of basalt that just cover large areas of the Earth's surface. Uh, the, what these things produce then is these large lava plateaus and even mountain ranges that are just built up of lava flows and basaltic rock. Fortunately, these things are quite rare. Now, only 11 have occurred in the last 250 million years. However, they have quite a dramatic effect on the world around them because five of these flood basalts are directly connected to mass extinctions. At the time these flood basalts occurred, life was going through a really hard time and a load of species were getting wiped off the face of the earth. And this is likely because of these flood basalt eruptions in many cases. So how do these things form? Uh, so there are lots of ideas about this, and it's still very much an ongoing piece of research. But our current ideas and our current best hypothesis is we think they form from mantle plumes. So mantle plumes are these huge, very hot pockets of material that form near the core mantle boundary and then rise up through the mantle. It's important to clarify that these are not liquids at this stage. They're not magma. They're just incredibly hot mantle rock. Because of their heat, they are less dense and they are buoyant relative to the mantle that's next to it. And so they rise, kind of like the mushroom cloud uh, after a nuclear bomb detonation. 
and they rise up through the mantle and when they hit the Earth's crust they push it up and out causing it to thin. This has two effects. Firstly it causes a substantial amount of decompression melting. So putting those hot rocks at a slightly lower depth produces melting by lowering the pressure. It also dumps a load of heat into the surrounding rock suddenly causing melting by elevating that temperature and crossing that melting point. So you get truly monumental volumes of magma getting produced at these hotspots. These then punch through the crust, uh, producing these huge flood basalt eruptions, creating large lava flows and essentially generating new land. And because of this injection of material and this pushing up of the crust, it can literally tear continents apart break up continents and so flood basalts are sometimes associated with the rise and fall of supercontinents. And the largest of flood basalt eruption that we know about did just that. That was the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Uh, this is a flood basalt eruption that occurred over 201 million years ago um, and it covered an area that was over 10 million kilometers squared. So that's nearly 2% of the Earth's surface just changed because of one eruption. This eruption happened in the center of the supercontinent Pangaea. It occurred at the boundary of the two main land masses called Laurasia and Gondwana. And that effect of that plume pushing the land up and out tore the supercontinent apart and sent those, those pieces on their way to the configuration they are today. So nowadays it's hard to get a true visualization of the extent of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province because it's split over three continents. Uh, so I'll just highlight uh, where that is right now to show you that it covers a huge amount of the East Coast of America and South America and as well as the West Coast of Europe and Africa. So this was a massive volcanic eruption and drove those plates apart forming the Atlantic Ocean. But it's not just on Earth we see them. If you want to see what a flood basalt looks like, you just have to look at the moon. So the moon's surface is roughly divided into two main regions, the Maria and the highlands. The Maria are those dark patches and the highlands are those lighter areas. All the Maria are flood basalt eruptions that happened early in the moon's history and literally drowned vast swathes of the moon. We also think flood basalts occur, but on an order of magnitude larger than the Earth on Venus. Because uh, if you remember back to that lecture, I mentioned that we think that planet has a periodic catastrophic overturn where the entire planet is resurfaced uh, by lava flows, which, which would certainly classify as a flood basalt eruption. And once these flood basalts cool down and produce igneous rocks, we call them large igneous provinces, uh, essentially because they are very big areas of volcanic rock. Uh, and there are lots of them dotted all over the Earth. Each one had a dramatic impact on both the climate of the Earth at the time, uh, the direction life was going, but also changing the shape of the Earth's surface itself. So the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province tore Pangaea apart, and we're going to be exploring a few others that did similar, similar things to the Earth's surface, starting with the Deccan Traps. So this uh, is a large igneous province, uh, evidence of a flood basalt eruption that had occurred in India. Uh, this is an example of it behind me. And as you, each one of those layers are successive lava flows that formed during this eruption uh, and essentially covered the vast majority of central India, producing this dramatic landscape of valleys that are cutting through this immensely thick basaltic flow. So the Deccan Trap, so traps comes from trapper in Swedish, which means stairs. Uh, and that's essentially because these successive lava flows, one on top of another, as they erode away, they produce this stepwise pattern in the landscape, hence Deccan Traps. As I say, these are successive layers of thick basaltic lava, and this formed around 66 million years ago. It covered a huge area in central India, around 1.5 million kilometers squared, which is around 0.2% of the Earth's surface, um, which is so not quite as big as the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, but still reshaping a large portion of the Earth's surface. Um, and this all this happened in around 30,000 years. So the entire eruption was over a relatively short period of time. The driving force for the Deccan Traps and that what caused that huge amount of melting was the Reunion Island hotspot. 
which was a plume that occurred around 66 million years ago, which at the time, India was much further south. Uh, it was hanging out uh, around Madagascar. And this plume came up just to the south of it, pushing the land up, generating these huge lava flows, flooding that central portion of India and essentially kick-starting it, uh, giving it a huge amount of energy and sending it accelerating to the north to eventually slam it into Asia and throw up the Himalayas. India is one of the most fast-moving continents on Earth because of this plume. Um, it's moving around two centimeters a year, which okay doesn't sound like much, but most other continents are going at around 0.5 centimeters a year. So, so it's going four times faster than all those other continents. So it's yeah, it's it's really clopping along. Now I said this formed 66 million years ago. If you're up on your mass extinctions, there's quite a dramatic thing that happened 65 million years ago, and that's the death of the dinosaurs. Um, now there was a lot. There's been a lot of interest in the Deccan traps surrounding the death of the dinosaurs because they occur at roughly the same time. And indeed, the Deccan traps would have released a huge volume of volcanic gases like sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, causing widespread climate change. Uh, it's estimated that the temperature dropped by around two degrees during this period, which is a huge amount to lose and would have had a dramatic effect on the climate. It would have also produced acid rain, changing the composition of the oceans and essentially producing a really toxic world. Um, and if you were a dinosaur around at the time, this would be a really horrible environment to live in. And so this likely would have pushed the dinosaurs and other uh, animals that were around at the time right to the edge of what they can handle. But the Deccan traps didn't, weren't the nail in the coffin for the dinosaurs. That came from space and a large asteroid impact that slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, uh, creating the Chicxulub impact crater. That is what did the dinosaurs in. Uh, this large 180 kilometer wide impact structure, throwing up huge amounts of ash, blocking out the sun, completely changing the environment overnight. Uh, that's what did for the dinosaurs. Uh, but it could be argued that the Deccan traps essentially pushed them to the edge and the asteroid impact just finished the job. But there's another flood basalt eruption that had an even bigger impact on life as we know it. And that is the Siberian traps in Russia. This volcanic rock covers a huge amount of the surface of Russia and indeed a huge amount of the globe as a whole. Uh, it's the largest volcanic event that has occurred in the last 500 million years. Uh, it occurred 250 million years ago and the entire volcanic eruptive cycle occurred over 2 million years. Uh, this thing covered 7 million kilometers squared, so not quite as big as the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, but it's still covering over a percent of the Earth's surface. And the volumes of lava it uh, erupted are truly monumental, around 4 million kilometers cubed. Uh, again, we think this was caused by uh, one of those big mantle plumes. Now, as you can see from the map, uh, it's covering quite a lot of Russia just there. And if you overlay the US, it would be over half of the landmass of the US is covered by this. So the Earth's surface would have looked dramatically different before and after this event. And the fallout from such a big eruption like this uh, was one of the biggest mass extinctions uh, on record, uh, which we call the Great Dying which occurred between the Permian and Triassic time periods and is known as the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. During this period, 96% of all species were wiped out, which is nearly all of them. Uh, so very nearly, this volcanic eruption nearly sterilized the planet. Um, the way it achieved this uh, is the amount of volcanic gases that were emitted into the atmosphere dramatically changed the climate, uh, way more than the Deccan traps did. Uh, this would have changed the composition of the atmosphere, changed the composition of the oceans, warmed it up substantially. Uh, this had a runaway effect uh, on the oceans, uh, causing ocean toxicity. Methane that had been trapped in the ocean bottoms at lower temperatures suddenly found itself at higher temperatures and was able to be released into the atmosphere, causing even further climate catastrophe 
re resulting in a really toxic world that none of the species around were equipped to deal with. And in fact, only a few of them just about managed to hold on through this until the climate had stabilized. So arguably, flood basalt eruptions have had some of the most dramatic impacts on climate and the most dramatic impacts on the shape of the Earth and the most dramatic impacts on life as we know it. So it's kind of ironic that large igneous provinces have such a huge impact when they erupt on the climate because they also provide us with really good resources and materials to currently combat climate change. So they're associated a lot of the time with deposits of nickel and copper, which are good for electrics, but critically, they're good resources of platinum group elements. So that's elements like platinum, iridium, osmium. And these elements are critical in the green revolution and the technologies we're developing uh, to produce green energy. For example, platinum is used in cars for catalytic converters to remove all the nasty chemicals and molecules out of your exhaust fumes that are toxic. And it's because of these deposits that we're able to get those materials and develop this new green technology. Uh, so this is an example of the Bushveld igneous complex in South Africa. And these rocks have nearly 10 parts per million platinum in them, which might not sound like a lot, but on every other rock on the planet, you're talking about uh, one to two parts per trillion. So one atom of platinum per every trillion atoms. Whereas here it's 10 parts per million. So 10 atoms per million, per million atoms, uh, which is, doesn't sound like a lot, but believe me, it's a lot. So in summary, while in the past large igneous provinces have caused dramatic climate effects, uh, they could now be the answer to solving some of our climate problems and providing us with the resources we need to combat it. So thanks very much for listening. So hopefully you now understand what a flood basalt eruption is and how these massive eruptions form through super plumes and plumes. Uh, how they can completely reshape the world around us by breaking up continents and accelerating continents across the globe, and how they can have a dramatic impact on the climate and life, uh, causing mass extinctions or contributing to mass extinctions. Uh, so with that, thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.